So we are in the middle of a series called Unearned. And in this series, we're looking at the word grace. And grace is a, a, a word that means the unmerited favor of God. And so it's kind of a simple word, but there's different forms of grace. And so in this series, we're kind of looking at all these forms of grace. And so we've talked about like a natural grace, saving grace, and measurable, sanctifying grace. And so today we're going to look at a different form of grace, which is this pursuing grace, this grace that pursues. It's like a central focus kind of grace. Now, I think for me, one of the strongest words in the English language is the word lost. Now, lost is not a very long word, but I think it's a strong, heavy word. And I'm thinking of lost in terms of misplaced, kind of like can't find, kind of lost. And uh, I, I, for me, whenever I lose things, there's this anxiety that gets built up. I think I'm not the only one in this place that feels that way, where let's say if you misplace your keys, you know, at first it's not a big deal. I'll eventually find my keys. And then the longer it takes you to find your keys, the more anger you get, the more anxiety you may feel. Maybe you've misplaced your phone. Now, I know for a lot of us, our phone is pretty much our life. And so when we misplace our phone, that's a huge deal. And for me, when I misplace that thing, when I, when I lose it, uh, at first, it's kind of the same thing where, hey, everything's okay, I'll eventually find it. But then the longer it takes, the more angrier I get. And I don't care what anybody else is doing. I want them to stop doing whatever they're doing and help me find my phone. I gotta find this thing. And, and so... Uh, also, I think it's kind of a rite of passage. I think majority parents, this is what helps me sleep at night, but majority of parents, they have lost their child in one way or another. And so about 12 years ago, uh, my, my son Logan was at school. He was at school all day. My wife was working. And so I had a daddy-daughter day with my middle child, Abigail. Paxton wasn't born yet. And so I had this daddy-daughter day with Abigail. We kind of plan the day. We're going to go to the park. We're going to go eating. We're going to go shopping. We're just going to have a day where it's just us together. And so we're in the middle of this day, and it's just this great day that's happening. It's like everything that you think is going to happen is happening. It's one of those perfect days. And so we're shopping. We're actually living in Eugene at the time, so we're at the mall. And uh, we're just kind of shopping. And, and my daughter at the time was like three years old. And, and I remember being three, four, five years old and hiding in like the coat racks and pretending it's a fort. Well, Abigail's doing the same thing. And she kind of jumps out at me. She's like, ah, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, we're just kind of playing. Well, about a minute or two goes by. And I remember thinking, I haven't seen Abigail for a bit. And so I start saying, Abby, Abigail, where are you? Can't find you. Still thinking she's playing, but I cannot find her at this point. And so again, this anxiety, this fear starts rising up within me and I start to kind of lose a bit of control. And, and so I start saying her name over and over again. Abby, I can't find you. I can't, where are you? And I walk out into the mall from the store and at the top of my lungs, I yell, Abigail. I just yell, Abigail, and nothing. And so I turn around, I walk back into the store. And at this point, the, the employees are looking everywhere that I wasn't looking. They looked in the dressing room and the back rooms are looking everywhere. <clears throat> now, when I think of us and God, I think it's the same way. I think, uh, I cannot help but think how at one time or another, and maybe currently, we have been lost, spiritually speaking, from God. And so today we're going to kind of look at the Bible kind of from a cover to cover kind of look from all the way from Genesis, beginning in Genesis, all the way to Revelation, how God has been pursuing you. Because the reality is this, is that pursuit is the proof of love. Pursuit is the proof of love. Now for me, I typically, when I teach, I like to teach over one passage. I like to teach over like one chapter, maybe a paragraph and kind of kind of pull some truths out of that. But today we're gonna do something a little bit uh, different where we're gonna kind of look at how God has been pursuing us from the beginning of time to today. So number one is he searches for us. He searches for us. And so we're gonna begin in the first book of the Bible called Genesis in, in chapter three. Now, 
in the first two chapters, God in chapter one, he creates the whole world and everything he says, it's good, it's good, it's good. In chapter two, uh, he, he gives some directions to Adam and Eve, the humans on earth and the humans in the garden. And so like he gives them instructions, what they can and cannot do, some responsibilities, what he wants them to do, all this kind of stuff. And so everything is good. And it took three chapters for the whole thing to kind of fall apart. And so in Genesis 3, we're going to read a few verses here. And this is what it says. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you certainly won't die for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it, and he ate it also." Now, this is the first, the original sin. And when I look at this text, I see Adam and Eve do a couple things. I think number one, what I see is they started to doubt God's word. Now, remember the first two chapters of Genesis, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. God created, God did this, it's good, it's good, it's good. God clearly communicated uh, uh, that what was required and the enemy worked his way in to, to put some doubt in their mind did God really say? And I think each of us, we have been in that place where we think to ourselves, did God really say I can do this? Or did God really say I'm supposed to do this? Did God really say I can't do this? And so we've been in these camps of like, what did God really say? And I think that's the enemy placing doubt in our minds. And then we start to believe those doubts. The second thing the enemy that does is that he, he begins to kind of formulate some doubt in God's goodness. And Adam and Eve, again, they kind of buy into it. Everything's good. Everything's good. Everything has a purpose. Everything has what it's supposed to be. But they start to doubt and they start to doubt his goodness. It shows that God is good in the first two chapters. And despite God's provision, the woman began to believe the lie that God had held something back. And again, I, I think that we feel this way at times. We think, you know, God, I, I, I don't know why I can't do this. You know, maybe you're a teenager and you're thinking, you know, I really, really like this person. I really feel love, like emotions toward them. I don't know why I can't do this. And we feel like maybe God's holding some things back from us. And from this, they chose to sin. Now, now listen to what God does here. We're gonna read just two more verses in Genesis 3, starting in verse eight. It says in the... Uh, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse nine, but the Lord called to the man, where are you? Now, because Adam and Eve had, had decided to sin, they chose to hide. Now, now, this was a perfect relationship before the fall like where Adam and Eve would hang out with God and they would, and God would be with them in the garden. There's this, this constant communication happening between them where they're unashamed and they know who God is. God knows them. And there's this perfect relationship that has now been destroyed because sin has entered the world because not only did they, did they doubt, but they, they chose to do wrong. This perfect relationship is now destroyed. They, they now feel enemies of God, ashamed and afraid, and they're afraid of their punishment is death. But what do you see God doing? God still wants to be with them. So much so that God knew exactly that they had sinned, but he still chose to go to the garden to be with them. But not only that, but he asks the question, he says, where are you? Catch this, God isn't surprised God, God isn't ignorant to the fact that he doesn't know where they are. He knows exactly where they are. He knows that they're hiding, but he's choosing to go after them. God is asking, where are you? Because he's leading them to confession. Now, I wish, you know, when you read Genesis 3, you just see them confess. But no, they just start pointing fingers to the serpent, to the woman, to the man. It was just this constant finger pointing that was going on. But you see, God pursued connectedness 
when they decided to be disconnected, he still decided to pursue them, even when they decided to kind of take some steps back. So the application. So for you and for me, we've all chosen to doubt God's word, to doubt his goodness. And God isn't surprised by our choices, but you see God is pursuing us to bring us back to him. So even in our darkest moments, even in this sinful self-centeredness, God is pursuing you. He loves you no matter what. So question I have for you is where are you? Where are you? In your relationship with God, where are you? Do, are, are you like Adam and Eve? Are you hiding from God, doing your best to hide from God? Even though God knows where you're at, are you, you, are you trying to act like nothing ever happened? Where are you? Are you uh, the type of person that's doing their best and, and got this will that I'm gonna will myself there, but, but, but because we're trying to will ourselves there, we know that we're flawed and we know that we mess up and we continue to kind of shy away from God. Where are you? You see, pursuit is the proof of love. Number two, we're gonna, we're gonna jump to the New Testament now. And, and number two is he comes to us. He comes to us. And we're gonna jump to the New Testament to one of the gospels and the gospel called John. In the, the first chapter, we're gonna read uh, about five verses here. In verse nine, it says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. In verse 14, it says, the word became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. You see, the book of John was written to uh, some new Christians and seekers and to prove that Jesus is the son of God. So that's why the book of John was written. And, and I think uh, this is the central focus of Christianity, that God left heaven for you that God pursued you, left perfection for you, that, that he pursued you enough that he left everything holy for you to come down to you. Then he's pursuing us, that Jesus came looking for someone and looking for everyone, whether you're rich or poor, whether, whether you have everything together or you think you have everything together or not, whether you're a fisherman, a politician, and anyone in between, he came looking for you. But the reality is we're all sinners. Romans 3.23 teaches us that we all fall short of the glory of God. We all make mistakes. We all choose to do poor things. We all become self-centered and sinful. But in spite of all that, Jesus is this. Jesus came as the pursuing Savior. He came to pursue us no matter what. So why did Jesus come to us? He came to us to give us, or to give his life, excuse me, to give his life. In Mark 10, uh, verse 45, it says, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to give his life to save ours. Secondly, why, why did Jesus come to us? Because it is a call to repentance. It's a call to repentance. Catch this in Luke, it says, Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Again, remember Romans 3.23, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all need repentance. We all are sinners. Jesus is the true solution to our problem. Remember the ransom has been paid. God took the first step. Now Jesus is calling us to respond to that kind of act of grace. Thirdly, why, why did Jesus come? To give eternal life, to give eternal life. 
You know, uh, you don't have to be a Christian to know this verse. You probably have heard this verse a thousand times, whether you've been in an auditorium like this or on camera or, or, or wherever. You don't even have to go to church to hear this verse. But John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But here's the thing, eternal life doesn't come automatically. It doesn't come automatically. It doesn't come automatically just because we, you know, we, we believe that he's the son of God. No, there's something deeper that happens. It's this heart confession about who he is, who I am not. It's when I place my hope and my trust in what he did for me. It's not what I do, but it's always about what he did. And it only comes once you place your trust in Jesus and you have to believe in him. So my second question is this, is are you placing your trust in Jesus? Are you placing your wholehearted trust in him? Now, I know that even though you're a Christian, you may struggle with some unbelief. I struggled for a long time in, in this, this idea of faith, that, that God did everything for me. And, and for a long time, I struggled with this belief system, but I continued to pursue him the best way I can as he was pursuing me and placing my trust in him. I love this. I was talking to uh, one of the pastors on staff and we were actually talking about this message. And he said this, he said, the cross is proof of why we need God's pursuit of us. And it's also the evidence of the pursuit. You see the cross is, I, I'll say it again. The cross is proof of why we need God's pursuit of us. And it's also the evidence of that pursuit. You know, Romans 5, 8 says, even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Even while we, were, uh, uh, we, we chose not to be with Jesus, we chose not to choose that lifestyle, he still died for us. Even in our worst moment, he chose to pursue us. That nothing can stand in the way of his love. Jesus loves us even when we're unlovable, even when we don't even love ourselves, even when we're stuck in shame and regret, even when we're in those moments, Jesus still loves us. He pursues us by giving his life as a ransom, calling sinners to repentance. And he came to give eternal life to those who believe in him with their whole heart. So in that moment where I'm searching and frantically trying to find my daughter, I go back out into the mall area. And again, I yelled her name. And this lady that was down a ways, about three or four stores down, she, she said, she yelled back, is your daughter wearing a pink shirt? Now, I'll be honest with you, I have no idea if she was wearing a pink shirt or not, but I said, yes, I think so. And I start running toward this lady who was pointing me toward this little girl that's at this little five, 25 cent candy machine. And I remember I ran to her and it was Abigail and I picked her up and I held her close and I said to Abby, don't ever leave me again. And I think that once we get in this place of trusting in Jesus, that he embraces us and he holds us close and he says, don't ever leave me again. In Luke 15, it talks about the lost sheep and one of the parables that Jesus tells and how it goes is, uh, uh, the shepherd gathers his whole sheepfold and, and he starts counting his sheep and, and he realizes out of the hundred, he's missing one. And so what does he do? He leaves those 99 and he goes after the one. He leaves everyone else in the sheepfold to go find the one. And once he finds the one, he doesn't yell at it. He doesn't get mad at it. No, what he does is he picks it up and he puts it on his shoulders and he carries it back rejoicing. And I think that once we're in that relation, once we choose to place our trust and hope in Jesus is that he is like that with us. He is rejoicing with us that we were once lost, but now we're found. You see, I want a God like that. I don't want a God to which I have to earn my way to. I want a God who loves me enough that even when I'm lost, even when I don't realize I'm lost, even when I'm hiding, I want a God that loves me so much that he pursues me. Because again, pursuit is the proof of love. You see, he's been pursuing us from the beginning of time. 
He's pursuing us today and he's also pursuing us to what is to come. So number three is he's returning to us. He is returning to us. In the last book of the Bible, in the last chapter of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 22, I'm gonna read you just two verses and it's verse 12 and 13. Jesus says, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done because I'm the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus is coming back for us, amen? That's, that's some incredible news. He is coming back to us. It's not, he, he didn't just leave us like, well, that's it. No, he is coming back to us. The pursuit didn't end at the cross. It didn't end at the beginning of time. He is coming back to us. He's coming again. When I think of being pursued, I, I think of someone who's focused. That, 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 that when you're being pursued, uh, that person is, is solely focused on you, that you are on their mind and will do whatever it takes to win you. I believe Jesus is the same way with you. He wants you to know that he has done everything so you can be in relationship with him. But he hasn't come just uh, once for you. He keeps coming again and again and again. I kind of want to break this down just a little bit in Revelation. Um, when when uh, he says, I'm coming soon, the word uh, soon here uh, in Greek is taki, okay? Not, not the really good like chip things, but taki, T-A-C-H-Y. Now, now there's two different meanings with taki, which means either soon, meaning a short period of time, or, or it, it's quickly, like, swiftly, suddenly. So these are the two different meanings behind it. Now, if we look at it as soon, if we look at soon as a way that we kind of understand it, kind of a, a uh, short period of time, we realize that Jesus has not came back, but we know it's coming, okay? And, and what that means for you and for me is that, that God doesn't use our standard of time. He has his own time that he uses. And so he is coming back soon. The other way of looking at it is this idea of quickly, meaning this, is that when he comes back, it's not like you have a good 30 seconds to one minute to get things right between you and God. No, what that means is it's suddenly, as soon as he comes back, you're with him. It's that, in, just like that, it's, it's over, you're just with him. So are you ready? Are you ready for that? And what does that mean, are you ready? Have you made that decision to place Jesus Lord of your life? Are you ready? Are you ready in the sense of surrendering everything to him, even your unbelief and say, God, I don't know what to do with this and I'm struggling with this, but I'm placing my hope and my trust in you. Are you ready? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Are you ready? Are you ready to receive that kind of grace that he has for you? Are you ready? You see, when we look at pursuing grace, we cannot help but see this over and over and over again, that pursuit is the proof of love. In every instance, we see that God loves you. Even in our mess, he searches for you. Even when uh, we think we can do it on our own, he comes to us and, and he wants to spend eternity with you because he's returning again. Now that happened with my daughter 12 years ago. And, and one thing I know is uh, she is now almost 15. And there will become a, a point in my life as well as in her life where she will be, um, you know, uh, moved on to college and then adulthood uh, and then possibly being married and have kids and all that kind of stuff. I, I realized something though, is that I need to continue to pursue her. I need to pursue my daughter in my relationship with her. I need to continue to pursuing her with the time I want to spend with her. I need to continue to pursue her in the love that I want to give my daughter. You see, when you pursue someone for the rest of your life, it is a constant 
everyday thing. I don't want my daughter to ever feel like it's already been done. I want her to know that her dad loves her so much that whether she's in my house or whether she is gone and in her, home, in her own life in 10 years from now, that I am continuing to pursue her in a relationship, time, and love because it's much how Jesus continues to run after you. But these three questions remain, is where are you? Are you placing your trust in him? And are you ready? Thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, we're gonna hand off to the campus pastors. Have a great week. Hey guys, I wanna close up with our missional moment uh, today. And we've been kind of going through this thing called the blessed strategy for about six or so months, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little less, but right in that six month kind of, kind of spot, we've been kind of going over this. And the reason why I've been going over this blessed strategy for a little while, because we wanna spend some time on these things. Uh, a lot of times churches, when they have kind of this strategy they want to implement, it's like fly over on everything. And, and so it's hard to really kind of know what we're doing. And so that's the purpose behind taking your time through this blessed strategy. And so we started with B with begin with prayer. Then we went to L with look and listen, listen for ways to uh, engage with people in your community and your sphere of influence. E is for eating. Uh, I think that's something we're all really good at. At least I'm really good at, enjoy eating, but also eating with people. Uh, sharing community together is what that's about. And S is for share. Uh, my challenge for you is, is this, is to join God in his pursuit of others, is to join God in that pursuit. And what that looks like is maybe just like sharing your story your story doesn't have to be completed. And the reality is none of our stories are completed. We're still kind of in the middle of the story. And so share where you're at in your relationship with the Lord. Talk about who you were before you came to know him to where you're at now. And if we all partner together in sharing what God is doing in our lives, I believe that this county and this world will look totally different. So in this blessed strategy, my, my challenge for you is to join God in his pursuit of others. Let me pray for you. God, thanks so much for today. Thank you for a chance of opening your word cover to cover. Thank you that we have a chance to see how you have pursued us from the beginning of time to, to today as well as what is to come in the future, that you have been pursuing us and you continue to pursue us again and again and again. You want to see our lives changed for your glory. And so Jesus, I pray that you uh, inspire us and you change us and you help us to share our stories. We, we share what you're doing in our lives. And so God, we place this in your hands and we trust in you. In your name we pray, amen. Hey guys, have a great week and we will see you soon. Bye guys.